This book came really out of an exhibition uh, I did in Arkansas with uh, the Good Weather Project space. And um, uh, the time seemed opportune to, to uh, present uh, more recent work uh, that I did um, over the last uh, four or five years. And I have been moving around quite a bit. Uh, I was in Iowa, and then I was three years in Minnesota. And I have done a body of new work um, that is kind of diverse, um, that responded to the context uh, of the places they, they were made in. And um, I felt the need to present uh, my work and to kind of sum up my experiences in those places. Um, and for a, uh, for a visual artist, it seems to be really important uh, to get the work out, to show it to my audience. And so I felt um, both the process of making a book, but also showing my work in another way than the exhibition um, felt really important to me. Um, also, uh, on the one hand, to promote my work, to bring it out into the world, but also for me to create, so to say, a record of um, my time, my five, the past uh, three to five years. And um, the University of Minnesota supported the publication financially. And there goes a different set of skills and considerations in making a book rather than the studio work that I do mostly alone. Um, um, so. Uh, documenting the work, uh, finding a structure for the presentation of the work. All these in, uh, are kind of new experiences. And I would say the publication is more or less an artist book. And it uh, also was a collaborative effort between Haynes Riley, who is both uh, running the, uh, the space um, in Arkansas, Good Weather, um, and who is also a designer. And then also between um, uh, Ruben Neuss, who is a painter in Minneapolis, and he wrote um, a text, uh, an essay about my work, based on his visit to my studio and seeing the work. And so it was a very good um, project to work on over the summer, and uh, it gave me insight into uh, all these aspects of a book production, for example. The work was basically done, and now it is another way of showing my work to the world. My artistic influences are shifting. It is never uh, one artist or another artist that are uh, really um, consistently influencing my work. Um, growing up in Germany, um, I was definitely influenced very much by uh, German neo-expressionism that was uh, very prominently featured in the 80s. That was, so to, so to say, the time I came into being as an artist, um, or it influenced at least my, my decision uh, to become a visual artist very much. Um, and then later, the American influences came also into the play. Um, and that, I would cite, uh, the minimalism, um, uh, conceptual art, conceptual consideration. Um, so I would say, as an artist, you never operate in a vacuum. You always uh, uh, look, f so to say, for the visual clues that you can uh, push forward and to try to interrogate and then also to figure out what is important for me and in this moment and in the time I am living in. And so starting with an expressionist, a symbolic expressionist like Edward Munch, uh, I would say that was an artist that kind of um, was with me for a very long time. Then um, artist uh, like Helmut Federle, who is a Swiss artist, who was very important, who uh, painted a series, Basics on Composition, uh, where he really interrogated uh, a simple form based on, so to say, a, a window or a letter form, H. Um, and he would 
um, apply paints in different ways, in different layers, in different colors, and so forth, but kind of based always on that kind of template of, of, of a very basic uh, composition. So that was really, that sense of also repetition was very, very important uh, for my own uh, development as a, a visual artist. Um, I would cite also um, uh, an artist like Martin Asik, uh, who is a more German, an uh, artist who is more known in Germany, who uh, practices a very unique way uh, of of painting and drawing and who, who combines both in, in, in really uh, important ways that became for me important. And there is a certain personal mythology that is uh, nevertheless also connected to the history of the art. And so uh, he would, for example, um, uh, have influences, or there, there were clearly influences, uh, for example, to um, Redon or uh, to um, James Ensor or Edward Munch. Um, and he was somebody I knew uh, because he studied with the same professor in Berlin. And, uh, but he was a few years ahead of me. And so, but his drawing practice, his painting practice, his use of an old traditional medium, just like uh, encaustic, for example, was very, I, I noted that and I found in him also uh, a possibility how to connect, so to say, or how to operate within the vast history of, of painting and to still make it relevant uh, for today and for me also personally. So Martin Asik was important. Then I would say uh, from America, um, the new imaginists um, um, like Susan Rosenberg, uh, an artist who combined um, certain geometric elements with more um, anthropomorph uh, and gestural um, forms. And uh, that also became very important and formative for, for my own work. I think my, uh, my work operates in different genres. Um, you could say it is abstract painting, but even abstract painting in my case is always based on the visible world and the world how I see it. Um, in many ways, uh, my work is based on, um, there's a German word, Zeitläufte, that is, so to say, the running of the times and how the times go. And it is, um, um, it is fluctuating, you know. Um, I would say um, uh, I work, or I should say my work is based on photographs that I collect from newspapers. Uh, often it can be something like, um, the number one page of the New York Times or something that I find in the internet. And to me, that connects it to um, current events. But the images are the part that, so to say, find me. It is not that I am looking for certain types of images. There is something in the images that interests me, that catches my attention. And it could be that there is something in there that um, creates a certain emotion in me. It could be something that has to do with its composition. Um, or it is a mix of both. And it is just that these images find me and I have an idea, or I may have an idea, or I have this wish to make a painting from that. And so, the process, really, that is important, that might uh, distance the finished painting from the original source image um, and also abstract the painting because I give it my own color, I simplify shapes, sometimes I make a composite of several source images, and often it is also that some memory or some imagination or so comes into play and so it is not, so to say, this that I paint an image. And, um, but the, the result is, so to say, its own um, being. And what I really need is time. I need space 
I need paint and I need canvas. And out of that, I can create something that can be experienced, um, not necessarily that you learn something from it. You are just witnessing the painting, as Ruben Noos, uh, the writer in the publication, would say. And so I don't know if I can really say um, there is a genre I would connect to. You could say there could be landscapes, there could be mental landscapes, um, there could be portraits, um, there could be uh, minimalist abstract art, there could be concepts. I don't know exactly. And this is, in a way, uh, to interrogate or to question what I'm doing is really an intricate part or in intrinsic part of my practice. And I just uh, don't know exactly the answers. But a book uh, like the one we are talking about today or an exhibition, which is something separate from, let's say, a book, it's a different form of expression. These are things uh, where I try to find a concrete and specific form, just like I find or try to find a specific form for each painting that I make. And so they are somewhat connected, but they're also independent from each other. Talking about more specific paintings, I would cite Hjertoyer or Merz. These were paintings uh, where I was feeling connected to a German artist, an early 20th century artist. And they came out of my thinking about his work, about um, his practice um, that he called Merz. Uh, the artist's name is Kurt Schwitters, and he uh, was mostly operating in, in the city of Hanover. And that is about not even an hour from Bielefeld, that is the city where I grew up in. And Kurt Schwitters had a truly multidisciplinary practice, which he subsumized under this title, Merz. So that practice uh, contained or was connected to uh, making collages, for which he is probably best known. He painted, he worked with his voice, he composed, um, he did a lot of things. It was very interactive. But uh, he also created spaces, which he called Merzbau or similar. And what is interesting to me is that Merzbaus or the, 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 uh, the Merz huts, he, they were destroyed. And they were following him or he was recreating them several times because he was forced to flee the Nazis in Germany. I think the first Merzbau was destroyed by fire. It was, so to say, one or two dedicated rooms in his apartment. Um, he rebuilt it, then he had to flee. He ended up in Norway. And even there, where he was basically without any um, means, um, and he was kind of, he didn't have a lot of money or anything like that. He still took along this idea and that wish and that impulse to create a space that represented his thinking, his experience, what he knows, what he feels. And um, uh, so it, it, where he also would integrate uh, artifacts from other artists and other periods. And so it kind of created really this kind of organ, or, or, organ um, how do you call this, organistic or, or uh, organic uh, uh, structure. So, and um, this shift in, in thinking, in perspective, um, responding to the time you're living in, and also sometimes that your environment forces you to make adjustments to your work. Um, a practice that is absolutely free, and at the same time, there are so many limits. That is fascinating to me. Um, I, d I identify myself as a two-dimensional artist, but I have been thinking about 
how can I integrate, uh, so to say, my di diverse output, the, the ideas that I have, um, the colors, the formats, and so forth. How can I unify them in a way? Or how can I make sense out of that? The book, again, is one form out of it. But I'm also thinking about how can I take, so to say, my flat two-dimensional paintings into the third dimension? And how can I create spaces, mental spaces, actual spaces? How I can fill spaces? This is really a question that uh, at the moment really occupies my research. And so um, uh, Kurt Schwitters is, so to say, a guiding light right now. And I've been looking into this. I read, I look at pictures, uh, documentary pictures uh, of his uh, iterations of that Merzbau. And, um, and I qu question, so what can it do to me today? So in these paintings here, Teuer is in its name a, uh, a reference to that little hut he built in Norway at the very end of his life. Um, Merz, and, and so it is basically um, a view into a cabin. It is somewhat abstracted. It uses a clashing kind of color scheme, red and green. And the picture plane is pretty much flattened out. At the same time, certain linear elements refer to some features of that hut. And so there is a space uh, that opens up to the viewer. At the same time, it is closed. There is a certain distance to it. And you can't really enter that space. And so it is somewhat enclosed, but also uh, creates a lot of possibilities of like filling it. When you look at that painting, you, you, you fill it with meaning yourself. It is still open enough so that you can um, it might, uh, you might see something geographic in there or geological or so. And I like that when the image is somewhat, um, it's, it, the image is somewhat open for interpretation. Uh, it's not uh, entirely clear. After all, I'm not making illustrations. But the painting hopefully creates, creates some kind of mental space also in you. And so this is really what it is more. It's a picture. Um, and my goal is to create pictures that somehow create a feeling or a memory or so in, your, in the viewer's mind. Personally, for me, libraries and archives are very important. Um, I mentioned that I use images as starting points for my paintings. They inspire me. And they are, for me, a depository of knowledge. Um, and I mentioned also that we are not operating in a vacuum as visual artists. We have to connect, uh, and we are connected to the history, to the rich history of painting. And I can only be connected if I learn about it. And my approach to libraries is open and open-minded. I hardly ever go into a library looking for a specific book. I love to browse when a library is open. I love to browse the shelves and to make discoveries, to learn something about something that I didn't know it existed. And. Um, and I, I, I always go, one of my first, if I go into a new area in a new f institution, my first, one of my first uh, activities is go to the library and see what's there. And so Boston College obviously now has a pretty rich and amazing library, uh, actually several libraries. Um, and uh, I was really happy to see uh, that there is, of course, uh, a, a vast amount of historic books, but also quite a lot of books that deal with contemporary art. And so that made me feel pretty good, <laughs> obviously. 
And uh, so my, my, my first walk is often to the new arrivals. And then I dig deeper and I go in the basement and go, so to say, to the areas where it's very quiet. <laughs> and, um, and of course, I look at some of the books um, uh, that have to do, let's say, with, with German uh, painting, for example. Um, but I'm also uh, going in other areas uh, that deal, let's say, with architecture um, uh, and literature. And that is really important to me because I think I, I, I love to read and uh, I, I discovered, you know, I, I feel connected to the literary world, I should say. Um, yeah, so, and, and then also I love the, the um, especially talking about books, just uh, uh, so to say the haptic quality of books. I love how they feel. I love to feel their weight. I open them. I love to look at the fonts, how they are, so to say, created, what their design is. Um, and so I think I reflect that a little bit in my own publication too. Uh, Haynes Riley, as I mentioned, did the design. And we, we kind of collaborated in it. We kind of used a font that is, uh, was a very new font. Uh, it de developed by Wolfgang Schwerzler in Leipzig. And so even the fact of that, in a way, is, is a connection also to the history, because uh, Leipzig has a long tradition of uh, typography, uh, font design, and printmaking. And so, yeah, just uh, so the, the, the form of the book is really important because it's a picture book. It's not a book to be read necessarily. And uh, the design of the book also picks up a little bit on how the works were installed uh, at good weather. Um, and so often you find, so to say, uh, the image as a, as a whole and then you find a detail shot. And so that kind of creates an interesting kind of scale contrast and also creates, again, a sense of space within the book. Um, and hopefully it creates a little bit of a, of a feeling like that viewers had when they came into uh, the gallery space. And something like that you find often in, in these libraries too when you look at, at books, uh, they are personal spaces in a way. Each book is, so to say, its own being and organ organism. And you find a world that is opening up. And I just love to sit and to read and to look. Well, I just arrived here at Boston College. Um, I Right now I'm kind of contained uh, to a small space where I do some drawing. I hope to get back to painting very soon. Um, Right now, I, again, I uh, look at uh, other artists' work. I'm kind of exploring my new environment. And I try to figure out what, what's coming next. Um, I plan to work on larger scale paintings and in continue to investigate, so to say, the pictorial spaces with, uh, and the actual spaces and how they kind of relate. Um, I also uh, want to look closer at imagery, uh, source imagery, what it, the ideas are that imagery convey. Because often, for example, artist uh, portraits and artist portraits uh, at work in studios often are staged situations. They are not necessarily snapshots or um, uh, kind of uh, done in a moment, but often they are kind of elaborately staged depending on how an artist wants to be seen, so to say. Or sometimes it is edited by somebody else, of course. So there is already some kind of process that uh, is in between, so to say, the original meaning and the artist and how the world sees him. And so I just uh, look for some kind of examples and, um, and see how um, yeah how they uh, how they can be used somehow in my my own work um, 
So, but again, I, I try to, I hope to continue uh, my, my work and also take into account, so to say, my new environment. And often um, it takes some time that it shows up uh, certain parts of, let's say, um, well, what should I say? <laughs> It's a bit uh, difficult to describe right now, but uh, I respond to environments, but I'm not immediately responding to my environment. And so that often, maybe after a couple of years or so, that there, there might be some allusions uh, to, let's say, Boston and New England and the light and so forth. So it's a really new territory I need to kind of explore right now. And there are artists, uh, you know, who have explored, let's say, the New, new England landscape and so forth. But, uh, and I, I really want to venture out and I want to kind of experience the light, for example, and the colors and the, uh, and the landscape. So far, I have always lived in the Midwest since I, my arrival in the U.S. And, and this is really uh, very different to me. So I need to kind of get adjusted and then I hope also to, to set up my studio and, and be able to uh, go back to painting uh, before soon. <laughs>